know. Okay. Please start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, uh, I'm very sorry for this technical problem. I will uh, I will start our meeting about hot topics in corneal infection and uh, ocular surface disorders with uh, co-chair of Professor Dr. Mahmoud Ismail, head of the Department Al Azhar University, uh, uh, Dr. Omang Mathur, Executive Director of Shroff's Eye Hospital, uh, New Delhi, India. He is a very experienced uh, cornea and uh, refractive surgeon, and Dr. Nedhi from uh, Shroff's Eye Hospital as well. She is a consultant of the uh, anterior segment and cornea and the refractive, and she is very experienced one in stem cell uh, transplant and local surface disorder. That's why we make it the hot topics. It is uh, my honor to have all of these new stars with us here in this topic, and I'm sorry again for being late to start because we have been hacked and some mistakes with the things. We have to start with the infective keratitis, which will be introductory for the others to start with. Uh, regarding the infective keratitis, what should we know? We should know that we have the normal defense mechanisms, including normal ocular flora, uh, immunity like immunoglobulin, A, G, B lysine, lactoferrin, lysozyme, polymorphs, and the conjunctiva uh, lymphocytic system, uh, and the anatomic defense mechanism as well, including the eyelids and cilia, blank reflex and tear film and its compositions and the integrity of the squamous epithelium and the bunctal drainage system. So if we have a collapse of the natural defense mechanism because of trauma or uh, immunocompromised uh, 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 patient, systemic disease, corneal surgery, contact lenses, or uh, ocular surface disorders, we might get the corneal infection if we have the organism. So these are the, the uh, what we call it, the predisposing factor, which makes the patient ready to get the infection. Okay. Uh, once the, what are the systemic factors that to be considered, and it is a, one of the most important predisposing factors for this uh, infection is alcoholism, coma, diabetes, nutritional or immune deficiency. What are the pathogenesis of corneal of infection and keratitis. We start with adhesion of the organism to the cornea, colonization and invasion, followed by polymorph nuclear aggregation, antigen antibody reaction, enzymatic uh, reaction and toxins. All of these lead to toxic metabolites and autolytic enzymes, which at the end ends with tissue injury. What is the rule for diagnosing infective keratitis? Uh, should you go to the shotgun approach or the laboratory-based approach? Shotgun approach lack accuracy for sure, but the clinical judgment is accurate almost in 89%. Why the laboratory based is delayed and accurate, but only in 76% of cases. So the best is to follow the golden middle bus in between, to start the gunshot and to do the lab before the start. We have the types of Infective keratitis, seborrheic or non seborrheic The seborrheic we have the bacteria, fungi, parasitic, and the non seborrheic like viral and immune mediated. If we go to the bacteria keratitis, we have the gram positive and the gram negative, pseudomonas, so staph, uh, strep, and gram negative, pseudomonas, so uh, uh, so and moraxella and enterobacteriaceae. But the gram positive, sorry, it was the pneumococci. We should be familiar with clinical diagnosis before waiting for the lab to give us the results. So we have to identify the clinical entity clinically to start treating treatment. For pneumococci, it occurs in both the trauma cases with sac infection sometimes and suture-related abscess. If you are uh, uh, you are removing sutures in corneal transplant, characteristically it is oval, yellow, white ulcer dense opaque stromal saturation uh, surrounded by relatively clear cornea. The cornea is relatively clear as you could see here. Uh, also call it ulcer serbignus, hypobin formation is always there, perforation is common in these cases. If we come to the staph infection, uh, we can, sorry, if we come to the, uh, to the, uh, to the staph infection, it occurs in compromised corneas with dry eye and bolus keratopathy, herbetic patients that's treated for a long time. We have 
we, it tends to have a localized coronal infiltrate, as you can see here, with fairly distinct borders. And you could see the corneal, the original corneal pathology in the rest of the cornea. It is the surrounding stroma is healthy except from the corneal pathology which is existing. If we come to Pseudomonas, it follows a virulent course with diffuse epithelial grain, diffuse liquefactive necrosis, ground glass appearance of the cornea. You have stromal edema, hypobion, and extensive tissue damage. Perforation is very rapid in these cases within 48 to 96 hours. Uh, more axilla, for example, it occurs after trauma in debilitated patient is over-localized and tend to affect the inferior part of the cornea. Modest trauma and anterior chamber reaction could exist. Fungal keratitis, we should know the type and the characteristics for this. What are the types of fungal keratitis that we have? We have the molds of filamentous fungi, like Fusarium and Aspergillus, and we have the yes, like the Chlamydia, so the Candida. For Fungal keratitis, there is a common characteristic for all. Uh, the common characteristic for fungal keratitis is, uh, it, is it is dry looking, grayish white, with elevated and rolled out margins. With elevated and rolled out margin. Stromal infiltrates with feathery hyphae Edges usually occur. Infiltrates with raised, is raised ab, ra, uh, are raised above the surface. If we we should know also that it is more it, it is it is caused by uh, yeah, more localized if you have if, if it is due to yeast infection and it has a color stud button configuration and immune ring and endothelial plaques, big hypobin which is dry and doesn't move with movement and it is not tilting with the patient health, uh, perforation is rare in these cases. And you see that the cornea is very densely infiltrated and sick. Corneal vascularization is absent in this case. So uh, filamentous keratitis like Aspergillus occurs in agricultural area and trauma with organic matter like wooden object and occurs in healthy individuals. And you could see here that we have a grayish white ulcer with dense infiltrate and the feathery hyphate Edges. Under high magnification, you could see here this dense infiltration, and this is the high fee and physical appearance under the high magnification. If we came to the candida, it occurs in chronic ulcers in immunocompromised patient and debilitated patient. It is a yellow white ulcer with dense saturation as seen in bacterial keratitis, but it is not the same. When we finish with this fungal keratitis, we can go to the candida. Uh, so to the acansamoeba keratitis, which usually follow traumas with organic matter and exposure to muddy water. These are the major causes of these cases. You could add to this contact lens where we're using the proper disinfecting solution. Uh, it is uh, it, 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 the most characteristic for this ulcer. It is not responding to the usual treatment for corneal ulcer and it diagnosed late, and the most tricky sign is the severe pain, as you can see it here, out of proportion to the ulcer. So the pain is big and the ulcer is small. Again, semiba keratitis uh, could present with bunctate epithelial lesions, ring infiltrates, very neural infiltrates, as you can see here. Sometimes it, this is, are not the only signs, but it can have a pseudodendrite similar to the dendritic viral ulcer, but it is not. But or negative staining, no staining at all. You just find corneal graying, or you have a double ring infiltrate in the stroma, as you can see here, or you could have a positive staining ulcer, as you can see in this one. Uh, before, after you finish identifying clinically what are you doing, you should document it with photographs and with the color coding drawing. And you should be familiar with the color coding, epithelial defect is green, stromal edema is blue, and the epithelial edema is blue, infiltrate is yellow, corneal scar is gray, blood vessels is red, if, and the complete line, if it's ghost vessels are red but dotted line, and the KBs is yellow, and the pigment in, pigments on the endothelium is brown. And you should 
draw the horizontal and the vertical dimension of this ulcer. It is three millimeter by one or two millimeter. Then you draw if there's coronal edema or stromal edema, and you draw the blood vessels and the stromal edema. This is a composite map, and these are the deep vessels stop before the limbus, and the superficial vessels cross the limbus. And you could see this fold and can be drawn like this, and epithelial edema and poly, you can see it here. And then you can find this KBs and you draw it. You should draw and document with photographs. How to diagnose the infective keratitis? Number one, proper history. Number two, clinical data. Clinical data and you'll be able to identify the clinical signs. Number three is the laboratory diagnosis. What about the laboratory diagnosis? For, the labor for history, you should have history and inquire about trauma, nature of trauma, with which material, psych infection, and conjunctivitis, ocular surface disorders, through therapy for long time, and long, long use of topical anti infective, and the presence of diabetes and its control, and inquire about its control in debilitating disease and the contact lenses used, and what kind of disinfecting solution are used. And when are you going to change the lens and change the lens case? And how did you clean it? Which material should you collect and send to the lab? You should collect samples from the lower conjunctival sac, upper and lower lid margins, and the corneal scrubbing and biopsies. And send it to the, before sending to the lab, don't forget the, the golden middle bass. The golden middle bass is to start with the shotgun approach and send your data to the lab to confirm the diagnosis. An instrument that is needed to get the samples from the cornea is a surgical blade number 15, Kimura spatula, bent tip needle of 21 gauge hypodermic needle, calcium algerate swabs, dacron polyester. Cornea scrubbing is taken from the active edge of the ulcer and the floor of the ulcer, not from any part of the ulcer. It should be taken from the active edge and from the floor of the ulcer. For diagnostic microbiology for infective keratitis, the sample should be divided into two separate paths. One of them is for direct smear staining and microscopic examination to detect bacteria and fungi and uh, viral. Bacteria you can detect with direct gram staining. Fungi you could do uh, what we call it the potassium hydroxide. Viral uh, staining you could do directly with the immunofluorescent monoclonal antibodies. And the other part of the smear is, will be sent for culture and isolation and growth of the organism because you couldn't get enough sample. The problem for coronal disease is our sample is small material, scanty, and hardly you, can, you cannot get enough sample to be tested. Staining techniques, you should be familiar with the staining techniques. Have, ha, how can you read it and to identify it? We have gram stain, gems stain, and the other stains. For gram stain, gram positive organism appears blue, as you can see. It. Gram negative is red. And you should be able to observe the morphology, whether they are cocci or bacilli, rods. I mean, the rounds or rods. Or they are in singles, as you can see here, or chains, as you can see here, or clusters, as you can see here. Because the characteristics of the microbe will determine its type. And of course, it's sensitivity to the different antibiotic and subsequent management. What are the possible organisms? Gram positive cocci, staph, strep, and pneumococci. Gram negative cocci is Neisseria. Gram positive bacilli, actinomyces, and Listeria. Gram negative bacilli, Haemophilus influenza, and Pseudomonas and Moraxella. These are the most common types. You should also do James stain, which can determine the predominant cell type, and it's better for certain bacteria like Haemophilus. And, and Moraxella, and it's better for fungi, excellent staining for uh, inclusion bodies of chlamydia, uh, of chlamydia. It is useful also for acanthamoeba keratitis. Potassium hydroxide mount, you can immediately after smearing the material onto the glass uh, slide, you can add a potassium hydroxide reagent and put a cover slip and examine directly under the microscope to see the fungal the fungal hyphae, or you see the spores, as you can see here. Uh, lactophenol cotton blue is 
useful for identifying the fungus and it is very important for identifying the morphology of the fungus to identify which fungus are you dealing with. Uh, other stains like periodic acid chef and mesenamine silver, the Nelson for mycobacteria, immunofluorescent stain for viruses, and the calciflower white stain for acansamoeba, we should be familiar. How did you mount the smear on the agar blade? It, this is scrubbing is like for the conjunctiva. And this, the, the red, you could write down. Right, R for the right, and in the lower part of the agar blade is for the lower lid, and the upper part of the agar blade is for the upper lid. And the cornea, you can have separate C's, as you can see here. So you will be able, here you have growth of conjunctival and corneal isolates, as you can see here. Uh, what are the cultural media available? And you should be familiar when you ask the lab, send me blood agar or chocolate agar or subroot agar or non-nutrient agar. Non-nutrient agar is used for acansamoeba. Subroot agar is used for fungi. Blood agar is used for aerobic, anaerobic, and bacteria and fungi. And chocolate agar for aerobes and facultate anaerobes and something like this. So the most useful media here is blood agar is very important and it, it accommodates aerobes, anaerobes, and bacteria. It is hard to find anaerobes in corneal infection because it is exposed to the air. And of course, Dr. Oman and Dr. Mahmoud has more experience in this subject. Uh, if we come to the culture media, we have also so many other culture media, tissue culture for viruses, Lovenstein Jensen for mycobacteria, brain heart infusion broth for fungi, and uh, cyoglycolate broth for aerobes and anaerobes. Uh, the culture media, what are you going? When are you going to read? And what are what to do after you could start to read the culture after six to 18 hours to 24 hours uh, some of the gross could you could see gross after six hours uh, see the, the gross and identify the colony characteristics of the organism again redo gram staining to confirm the diagnosis antibiotic sensitivity is to be done on nutrient agar blade it needs time Antibiotic sensitivity it needs time. That's why we should start our treatment before waiting for the antibiotic sensitivity. And we should do the biochemical test as well on the cultures. Other tests like coronal biopsies could be done when, if in case of failure of the culture and the staining to reveal the diagnosis, or the ulcer is not responding to treatment, or if you have a cancemiba keratitis. Because a cancemiba you cannot detect it except by high clinical suspicion and the lab diagnosis. And you could also do sex syringing, blood sugar testing, general examination as well to test for the sugar. Coronal biopsy, as you can see, is indicated only in cases of non-healing ulcer, deep stromal infiltrate, and I can send you keratitis. Other techniques like polymerase chain reaction, BCR, could be used for the diagnosis. The most recent ones is the fluorescent antibody test, which can be used for diagnosing herbis simplex. What are you going to take home message from this meeting? If you want to diagnose and to be really able to work well with a case of infective keratitis, you should have the proper knowledge to identify and you take careful history to help you and to get the clue and to do proper examination and documentation and the photos for follow up with enough lab knowledge and don't forget the golden middle path for diagnosing infective keratitis which is start with the shotgun approach and followed by and confirmed by the laboratory based diagnosis thank you very much for being with us now i should stop sharing sharing and we'll ask uh, Dr. Omang Mathur to start his presentation. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Mahdi. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here and uh, present my talk. Uh, I'm 
sorry for the late start. Uh, I think we had some techn technology difficulties. Uh, so after a very comprehensive talk from Dr. Mari uh, on separative keratitis and how to manage, uh, this talk would be on herpes simplex keratitis. Uh, herpes simplex keratitis is generally very common. And let me start with this case, which presented to us a 70-year-old one-eyed patient with pain, redness, watering in left eye of two months duration and the diminution of vision of two months duration. The patient was on uh, empirical therapy with antibiotic eye drops, uh, but had shown very little improvement. So we see an epithelial defect and we see infiltration and thinning and vascularization. And we did a, a corneal scraping which showed some gram-positive cocci. So what is our diagnosis here? We'll come back to this case. Now, if you look at HSV keratitis, there are in the US itself about 50,000 new cases. Now, in India, uh, and I would imagine very similarly in Egypt, we, what we see in the clinic, what remains in our minds is uh, more separative keratitis, especially in India, we see a lot of fungal keratitis. And sometimes we forget that there's a lot of HSV also. Uh, and uh, I think it's a similar number or higher that we would see in our populations too. Now, 50% of the population at any point is infected with HSV1. And I think it's very topical with all the virus talk happening. HSV, another virus, uh, is found in almost 100% cadavers over the age of 60 years. Uh, it resides in trigeminal ganglion. And so almost all of us seem to be at risk of getting HSV, while some unfortunate people tend to get the disease. But it's not like we don't harbor. I think it's our immunity that handles it. I did some literature, even populations in Egypt, although 97.5% of Egyptians uh, are Zero positive for HSV. It is the most common infective cause of blindness in the developed world, and recurrences are typically with the same strain. We are still not very sure what triggers it, but it's said that fever, hormonal changes, UV exposure, stress, ocular trauma, and eczema laser are some of the inciting factors for this virus. Now, we can divide the cl clinical manifestations of HSV as congenital and neonatal ocular herpes. Then we have the primary ocular herpes and the more common recurrent ocular herpes. Now, the, uh, this was a five-day-old child presented with a red eye and, uh, and actually presented with a cloudy cornea. And... We thought it was one of the congenital corneal opacities, but uh, we noticed these lesions on the skin, and there was a little redness in the eye. And when we did an EUA for the child, we saw staining patterns not only on the cornea, but also on the conjunctiva. It's very common to get these conjunctival dendritic ulcers in congenital herpes. The infection obviously comes from the mother. A lot of times these children are very sick and they may get encephalitis. Often they get treated as septicemia in neonatal ICUs, but actually the problem is herpes. Here the patient's PCR was positive and then was treated with intravenous acyclovir, 20 milligrams per kg TDS and topical acyclovir. The maternal HSV was positive. Now, it's not very common. It's pretty rare. I would have seen about three or four cases in my practice. Uh, it's caused by, the ocular herpes is mainly caused by HSV1, but neonatal herpes is caused by HSV2. What is said is above the waist is HSV1 and below the waist is HSV2. And since the infection usually comes from the birth canal, the congenital herpes is HSV2. Primary ocular herpes 
very few patients actually will manifest this. Uh, it's an innocuous kind of infection. It, uh, most of the times, most people will not have any symptoms. Only 6% of these patients ever present to a doctor. Uh, by age 5, almost 60% of the population is infected. So these would be small lesions that may come and without any treatment in a few days, they go away. You may get follicular conjunctivitis, keratoconjunctivitis, dendrites on the conjunctiva in the cornea, multiple dendrites on the cornea. The more common recurrent corneal herpes is classified as infectious epithelial keratitis. So there's an epithelial disease where you may have corneal vesicles, the most, most pathognomonic is dendritic ulcers, geographic ulcers, and marginal ulcers. This is what we call as epithelial disease. Of course, the commonest manifestation would be dendritic ulcer for HSV. Then you have neurotrophic keratopathy, which is neither immune nor infective. These are punched out lesions like this. Uh, that is neurotrophic keratopathy. Then you have stromal keratitis, which is of two forms the necrotizing stromal keratitis and the immune stromal keratitis. Then we have endothelitis. Uh, endothelitis can be diskiform, linear, or diffuse. Trabeculitis and uveitis. Now, sometimes we may see these kind of footprints on the cornea. This is not active ulcer. If you stain, you won't find any staining, but once the lesion heals, for some times you may see these uh, lesions. Uh, these are grayish white subepithelial opacities, uh, which are left behind for some time. Almost 25% of the epithelial disease will uh, have stromal disease subsequently. Neurotrophic keratitis is these clean, punched out lesions, usually in the mid cornea, a very clean base. And if they are left like this, they will eventually progress to a lot of thinning and perforation. Uh, this is basically a basement membrane problem. At this point, it is neither immune nor infective. So there's impaired corneal innervation and they have intense collagenolytic activity. And so they need uh, very urgent treatment. Now, because the corneal sensations are lost, the afferent limb of the tear reflex is not working. So this results in very severe dry eye. And so one has to manage the ocular surface very well in these cases. Tarsorephy helps uh, considerably and the patient uh, starts healing with the tarsorephy. Stromal disease, about 20 to 48% of the recurrent herpes are stromal disease. There, there is one necrotizing stromal keratitis, which has direct viral invasion, and the immune stromal keratitis, which is an immune reaction to the virus. So coming back to our patient, here is a patient who has an epithelial defect. There is stromal infiltration. There is thinning. There could be AC reaction, even a streak hypopion. The picture looks very much like a bacterial keratitis. However, the giveaways are that the patient may come walk into your clinic with this looking red eye with a large ulcer, the patient may have not have pain. The eye would be fully open. There won't be any blepharospasm. Uh, if the pain is there, it's probably because of the uveitis and not because of the surface problem. That gives you a clue. Why is this patient not blinking? Why is it not... Uh, wincing with pain and why is there no spasm? And that's because the sensations are poor. They may also be very little discharge, which you expect in a bacterial keratitis. Uh, also vascularization. Vascularization, a bacterial ulcer will not give you that much time. It usually is very fast, except for some organisms like mycobacterium. So looking at vascularization, thinning, infiltration, and lack of sensations, one should suspect a viral etiology. And if you probe a little more, the patient will give you a history of recurrence. So this is a patient who had episodes in the past. Uh, patient was not very symptomatic. While the 
Ulcer was very angry looking with no slough and sensations were absent. The patient was treated with oral acyclovir 400 milligrams five times topical ointment and just an antibiotic for secondary infections and a lot of lubrication. And the patient started to respond, took some time. There is always a little immune component and inflammation. So bread acetate was added after two weeks. The patient showed a response and finally healed like this. So history of recurrence, pain but no photophobia, corneal sensations diminished, minimal discharge in presence of vascularizations are clues towards this diagnosis. This was another patient with infiltration, epithelial defect, and corneal edema. Again, the patient had poor sensations. With this treatment, the patient responded quite well. So three months history, infiltration, stromal keratitis, thinning, but a lot of vascularization. The patient responded to the treatment of antivirals and it eventually needed a tosserophy uh, because the sensations are very poor and healed with a scar. Now, necrotizing stromal keratitis has direct virus invasion. There's necrosis, ulceration, and dense infiltration. So it has an inflammatory component as well. The main differential diagnosis is bacterial keratitis. So whenever you see a patient who has a long history, non-healing ulcer, probe deeper into history of recurrence, and uh, check sensations, and the clue is that while the as the patient is walking into your eye, there's a red eye, there's an obvious corneal ulcer, but the patient is keeping his eye completely open. A very common entity, I think after dendritic keratitis, probably the next commonest entity is endothelitis. So here you have corneal stromal edema without infiltration, and just behind the edema, you'll find KPs. Uh, so inflammatory response at the level of endothelium, there's KPs, uh, but there's not much of stromal infiltration or neovascularization. It's localized to that area. So it could be diffuse sometimes where the entire cornea is involved. More commonly, it's coin-like and disc-like. That's why it's called disciform. Sometimes when the edema is a lot, you don't see the KPs, but as it starts resolving, the KPs become uh, more visible. In iridocyclitis, again, you may have uh, KPs, AC reaction, posterior cycniki. You may get in a patient just uveitis, or you may have a patient who has corneal scars and now has uveitis or a mixed picture. Trabeculitis is common, and in a lot of your herpetic patient, you must check intraocular pressure because uh, trabeculitis can cause rise in intraocular pressure. Sometimes I feel uveitis pattern is so common that a lot of idiopathic uveitis that we see is probably herpetic. Now, herpes, herpetic uh, disease, eye disease study, the head study, uh, was a landmark study that we learned a lot of new things from. So one of the things that it said was that topical corticosteroids used in heads was significantly better than placebo in reducing the persistence or progression of stromal inflammation and in shortening the duration of herpes simplex stromal keratitis. So if you use steroids in stromal keratitis, it is of benefit. That is what the head study uh, suggested. It also noticed that oral acyclovir in the treatment of HSV stromal keratitis did not have any significant benefit over just topical steroids and topical antiviral. So in the US, acyclovir uh, topical was not available and they used trifluoridine, but a topical acyclovir actually is much better than tri uh, trifluoridine. So now, what is stromal keratitis? It's important to uh, understand. the herpes study showed all the endothelitis as 
uh, stromal keratitis. They did not differentiate between stromal necrotizing keratitis, stromal immune mediated keratitis, and endothelitis. The classification of viral keratitis came up later. So most of the cases in head study were actually of endothelitis, which has been classified as stromal keratitis. And here, surely, oral acyclovir in the treatment will not show any benefit. Topical steroids will, because this is an immune-mediated uh, disease. So if you are dealing with endothelitis, the treatment is topical steroids. In the treatment, oral acyclovir will not show any benefit. So if you look at the classification, uh, in the epithelial disease, one minute, you have active virus in geographic and dendritic ulcer. In necrotizing stromal keratitis, there's active virus. And in trabeculitis and uveitis, you have active virus. While endothelitis is an immune-mediated uh, disease, so you would not find acyclovir beneficial in the treatment. Now, here's a patient who had this infl uh, infiltration, vascularization, and an epithelial defect. Uh, looks like a case of stromal necrotizing keratitis. We gave this patient oral acyclovir, topical acyclovir. The patient was PCR positive for HSV. The patient started to respond. We added topical steroids and the inflammation comes down further and the patient starts to heal like this. In our study, we did a study on stromal necrotizing keratitis on 13 patients. 10 weeks, they were given oral acyclovir 400 milligrams five times a day uh, with two weeks of topical acyclovir. Subsequently, we added topical steroids. 70% of our patients were HSV uh, PCR positive. And we found that topical and systemic acyclovir in stromal necrotizing keratitis was of benefit. And adding topical steroids uh, decreased the inflammation and improved visual recovery. The head study actually did not recruit enough patients. And so they had this in one of their arms, but they could not study them because there weren't enough patients in them. Now, head study, of course, in those days was a totally clinical study. It did not do any laboratory investigations. So like I said, uh, infectious keratitis, where you have live viruses and dendritic keratitis, geographic also, here, topical acyclovir is the mainstay of treatment. For the treatment, there is no role of oral acyclovir in, top, in the surface disease, which is the epithelial debris. So if you have dendritic ulcer and geographic ulcer, the only treatment is topical acyclovir, uh, topical antiviral. When you have a deeper disease, like a necrotizing stromal keratitis, we found benefit of adding oral acyclovir 400 milligrams five times a day. Endothelitis is an immune mediated uh, condition where you may not find benefit of uh, acyclovir, while uveitis, uh, uh, there is benefit of using oral acyclovir. The head study did not show a statistical significant, but there was a trend towards improvement with oral acyclovir and uveitis. Now, there is a lot of recurrences over a period of time with HSV, and that's the big problem. Now, one of the important things that uh, the study showed us was that, uh, okay, we'll come to that again. Now, this was a patient of a geographic ulcer. Note and see these extensions like dendritic instinct. Now, this is very much like, could very much look like a neurotrophic ulcer, but this is a geographic ulcer because it, have, it has active dendrites in the periphery. This patient will 
uh, also have poor sensations and will be stain positive. With topical acyclovir, the patient starts to respond, and the first thing that responds is that these dendritic extensions get blunted. Now, one would think that this is the end of the story. However, if you notice that there is an epithelial defect punched out lesion over here. So this has now become a neurotrophic ulcer. So the patient undergoes a tarsorephy, and we feel that this is now healed and happy ending. And now the patient presents a few weeks later with an infiltration in the stroma and becomes a stromal disease for which oral acyclovir is given. Now, one of the important things in the head study was that the role of oral acyclovir, 400 milligrams twice a day for prophylaxis. And it showed a 41% reduction in the probability of getting recurrence. So this has been a very important thing that by giving oral acyclovir, you can reduce the number of recurrences, not to zero by 41%. Keratoplasties is a big problem with herpetic infection. They do very poorly. Almost 21 to 39 percent develop a recurrence within the first year. And unless it's really indicated, one should avoid doing a corneal transplantation in herpetic disease. Only for one eyed patients, if at all. Uh, with oral acyclovir, the results have become a little better. But I would still feel that unless it's really, really necessary, one should avoid doing a corneal transplant. So there are fewer rejections by using oral acyclovir. Uh, now the one big question is how long do you give uh, the prophylaxis? When do you stop? So basically the answer is that the prophylaxis works only for the time that you're taking the medicine. So if there is a graft which you want to preserve, the patient may need to take this lifelong. If it's a one-eyed patient, again, you have to give it for a very long time. Uh, you have to check the kidney function tests. Uh, so that is important when you're using this. So herpes is a very important disease, uh, very common uh, that we see. And it's important to know all its different manifestations uh, I hope some of it would have made sense. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Dr. Omen, thank you very much for your nice presentation. And we are sorry for these interruptions that had happened with the technical difficulties. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. usually it happens. But we're lucky that we have so many assistants. Our yeah. friend, Dr. Ihab, he assisted us here. Now we are, we are going to give the talk to Dr. Nidhu. Uh, he, she is going to talk about ocular surface disorder and stem cell transplant. She is a consultant in uh, Dr. Shroff's hospital in New Delhi. You are welcome, Dr. Nidhu. You can start to share your presentation now. Yeah, and thank you, Dr. Nidhu, for the opportunity. Uh, You're welcome. Straight start. away. Uh, because of the time limit that we have. Um, yeah. So I will be speaking, good evening all the viewers, I will be speaking about the limbal stem cell transplantation. So I, my talk would be floating from the physiology of limbal stem cell transplantation, limbal stem cells to the limbal stem cell deficiency state of the eye. And then we would see what are the variable techniques of limbal stem cell transplantation, which, are, which we can use. And finally, go on to talk about the most prevalent and now most practiced simple limbal epithelial transplant technique of limbal stem cell transplantation. So that is how our cornea looks, absolutely crystal clear. It is lined by non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And you, as you can see, um, I would use a laser pointer here that this is where the limbus lies and the limbus is where limbus is where the origin of these cells which are floating in to epithelize the cornea are supposed to be lying. Now if you look at the embryonic development of this limbus, it originates from the surface ectoderm and a part of it is supposed to be coming from the mesenchymal cells that float out to form the limbal part of the 
lumbus of the cornea. Are you is everyone able to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. No problem. Okay. Okay. So going on uh, to the from the limbus, we would see if you see at clinically, you can see a pigmented zone over here, which is uh, where the limbus lies. And if you see the magnified views, these are the views which have been taken from the ASOCT machines and the histopathological section of the limbus. There lies the palisades of these are the crypts. These are the crypts from where the cells are supposed to be lying. Dr. Nedi, I'm unable to uh, move my presentation down. Uh, is there an issue? Your presentation? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, look at the structural imaging and the kinetic imaging uh, techniques which have been used to magnify this area and they have been now being used increasingly to trace these cells to find out exactly what are the cells which are responsible for the, uh, for the epithelization of the corneum. Now, something characteristic about these cells is that they function as a family. They are, exist in the form of a niche, which is a microenvironment, and it has a very delicate balance. These cells are uh, not only composed of these cells, which have the high nucleus to cytoplasmic ratio, are so slow cycling cells, but also function with other cells along with it, for example, the melanocytes, which protect them from the UV radiations, the limbal fibroblasts, and the limbal epithelial stem cells within different stages of their uh, multiplication. So one cell at the limbal stems, uh, at the limbus, which is the limbal stem cell, multiplies, and it forms the transient amplifying cells, which further divide to form the post-mitotic cells, and finally form the terminally differentiated cells. So they slowly differentiate as the demand comes from the epithelium. And this migration and differentiation usually takes about seven to 10 days to happen. Now, what is the model by which these cells, magnif these cells migrate? One of the models is the centripetal mo migration model, which says that at the limbus, there is this multiplication of these cells which happen. And these multiply, multiply differentiated cells move from periphery towards the center. This is the most prevalent and most accepted way migration model that we know. However, there is another model, which is called the tectonic plate model, which states that the limbal stem cells are not just present at the limbus, but they are prevalent in the conjunctiva as well as in the, as well as in the cornea. And they're equally prevalent all over. However, the limbus forms an equilibrium from where there is a barrier which is maintained between the conjunctiva and the cornea, and hence the cornea is clear and the conjunctiva, conjunctiva however, is mildly opaque. What happens is that you, in, in the normal physiological state, these cells, the family of these cells, remain in a very delicate and a very good balance of equilibrium of differentiation and migration, and finally the loss of the cells. And whenever an epithelial wound healing is happening, if this balance is fine, these cells would be differentiated well into coronal epithelium and the coronal reflex will be good. However, suppose in any of this state, because of the any of the pathology, this delicate balance is affected, then we go on to the stage of limbal stem cell deficiency. Now, this limbal stem cell deficiency is characterized by, as you can see in the patients, the symptoms would be of pain and redness, and you can see the growing of this conjunctiva onto the cornea, the limbal barrier has been crossed, and there is a, some amount of scarring which is present over here. And typically in the fluorescein staining in early stages, you would see this conjunctivization of the cornea happening. However, the presentation of these patients can be very variable. As you can see, it can be mild to moderate to very severe, can be associated with simbiferons, can be associated with tear deficiency, can be presenting with epithelial defects, and usually 
the patients can have foreign body sensation and photophobia along with decrease of vision. Now, this presentation would also depend upon the cause or the etiology behind the limbal stem cell deficiency. If the limbal stem, stem cell deficiency is primary, then it can be because of the aniridia, multiple endocrinal deficiencies, epidermal dysplasias, and dyskeratosis congenita. However, the secondary causes, which is secondary means later, which have been acquired, can be most commonly the presentation be because of the chemical and the thermal injuries. Then it can be because of the immunological disorders like Steven Johnson syndrome and ocular psychiatrical pemphicoids. And the other causes could be iatrogenic, contact lens wears, radiations, post radiation therapies, and neurotrophic keratitis. Let's go on to management of these patients. And before even we begin to discuss this, we should understand that the management requires a very comprehensive approach. It requires an ocular surface person or a cornea person to manage these cases along with a full team of oculoplasty specialists and immunologists, a glaucoma and retina for the comorbidities, and a good steel contact lenses for a complete management of these patients. And nevertheless, obviously, a psychologist will be required because usually these patients are chronic patients and they have a lot of photophobia and decrease of vision for a long-term basis. The management would also depend upon the stage at which the patient presents. If the patient is presenting at the acute stage, then you need to manage and save the globe first. If you are in the subacute stage, then you probably need to manage the inflammation first. However, if you are in the chronic stage, then maybe the visual rehabilitation would be the focus in these patients. Now, these patients could be managed with so many procedures, with various uh, mutations, various forms of you know, uh, catering to the demand of the patient. From all these managements today, we will be focusing on the stem cell transplant technique. Now, stem cell transplant technique primarily means that the patient is presenting you with a limbal stem cell deficiency, with redness, watering, pain, blurring of vision, and a picture of conventualization of the cornea as we discussed. And you are going to make the patient go on after the limbal stem cell transplantation to a state of improvement of the vision with no redness, no pain in watering, and a good corneal reflex, an epithelized surface, and an intact limbal barrier. Now, how do we achieve from first stage to the second stage is by limbal stem cell transplantation. However, there are some prerequisites for going on before we start off to decide on to the surgery is these patients and the eye which we are going to treat should have a good vision potential. There shouldn't be a blind eye where we are going to treat them. It should be a wet surface, a dry surface is not a good surface to start off for the limbal stem cell transplantation. The Sherma should be at least above 10 mm. The primary inflammation for the pathology with which the patient is present it should be treated first, meaning the patients with chemical and thermal burns should be probably be waited for about six months to one year for the inflammation to settle before you start for the limbal stem cell transplantation. And you need to correct the adnexial pathologies in these patients by treating the associated semiferons, entropions, ectropions, to cases before you start to do a stem cell transplantation. And nevertheless, the most important would be to decide upon the source for the limbal stem cells in these patients. So the evolution of the limbal stem cell technique uh, goes on from the keratolimbal allograft, which came first, and then came the technique of conjunctival limbal autograft, and then came the technique of cultured limbal epithelial transplantation. We'll go on through this journey from one technique to another. So the first technique that I'm discussing is the keratolimbal uh, transplantation. So it is an allographic technique. That is the first thing to be understood. Here, the donor tissue is the Cadbury chi. Usually you would require two tissues and you would require to take the keratolimbal grafts from these both the tissues and dissect them to about one third the thickness and take, divide them into halves and take three halves and suture them after the periotomy and the dissection of the panis in the periphery of the patient's affected eye. This technique, uh, after it's, if you will look at the literature, the systematic review of the clinical outcome on these patients shows that the best corrected visual equity achieved 
uh, above uh, about 660 was in about 70% of the patients in a mean follow up of about 114 months uh, as the maximum follow up however this uh, result is not very um, dependable primarily because uh, the time at which clnl was done was the time was the era where the success of the technique was not uh, was not uh, nicely defined hence the studies have given variable success uh, criteria however uh, on overall the patients had about a 70% uh, outcome in the vision from clnl let's let's go on to the next technique uh, which is the conjunctival limbal autograph technique here uh, the patient's uh, unaffected eye that is in, uh, is is from where you take the grafts you take about 2 clock hours superiorly and 2 to 3 clock hours inferiorly uh, a, a keratolimbal graft and you suture it at the superior and the inferior uh, limbus in the patients after dissection of the panis and the periotomy which you do now this technique uh, in its published review uh, shows about between 80 to 100% improvement in vision of about 25 to 100% of the patients with a survival rate of about 62% at about 6 years of follow uh let's go on to the next technique which is the <coughs> cultivated limbal epithelial transplantation now cleft was the last decade was the technique which was used in last decade um, very uh, very extensively it was the only technique uh, which was very widely accepted after the klm and the claw and it has its own advantages now cleft meant uh, that this is the unaffected eye of the patient from which a biopsy limbal biopsy of about 1 to 2 mm was taken from the superior or the inferior limbus and then it was transplanted to a culture plate and taken to a lab a very specialized lab where for about 2 weeks uh, the growth was allowed to happen in an incubation chamber the patient was uh, had to wait for about 2 weeks of period and once the results of the growth in the lab were out the patient was called back and was taken up for the surgery of the affected eye uh, in which the dissection of the panis was done and the grown amniotic membrane or whatever be the culture media in which the cells were grown were transplanted to the patient's eye so this technique gave about 70 to 80% of the success rate uh, it came in about 1997 uh, where pellegri had given its first outcomes uh, of clet and it was practiced widely the advantages of clet were that there was very less risk for the donor's eye if you see in claw about 3 claw cars above and fear would mean about 50% of the cornea the donor eye was losing its limbus uh, as by this technique you, you could take a very small biopsy and get uh, good results in the affected eye you could treat bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency if you had a very small spare limbus from where you could treat uh, the take the biopsy there was a possibility of recasting after the failure you could freeze this uh, cells and uh, transplant it later it could also be associated with the gene therapy and there was obviously a proof of concept which was available for bilateral diseases in through tet however the challenge is a problem with this uh, is that it requires absolutely a very specialized extensive lab for it to be practiced the patient has to come for two visits and wait for about 2 to 3 weeks for the results to come out and uh, at current at current uh, scenario there was no protocol which was defined for these stem cells uh, cultures to be taken there were very variable protocols which were followed and hence the results also were uh, were very diff- difficult to summarize primarily because there was variable techniques of uh, culture which were used worldwide now what came in 2012 by the samvan et al group from ap prasad was a very efficient and a simple technique which is called the simple limbal epithelial transplantation it is after this technique uh, we started extensively at shop to do a uh, limbal stem cell transplantation and this technique uh, uh, if you compare it to clet is very similar to how the how it is done except that the lab part is is deleted from the technique we take the biopsy from the donor's eye and instead of taking to the lab we just transplanted after the patient's uh, panis dissection either in uh, 
partial or total limbic stem cell deficiency by by putting it on to the amniotic membrane and going on to the surface of the patient's eye in the same city so i'll be going on to the uh, to the video of uh, one of the patients so this is a patient where total limbic stem cell deficiency is present you can see a 360 degree pan has grown onto the cornea with the corneal scarring and a vascularization so i'll be playing the video of this patient so this is where we uh, where we are taking the biopsy from the unaffected eye so we are holding the uh, conjunctiva which has been dissected about 2 mm beyond the limbus with the non tooth forceps and using a uh, wescott scissors we are trying to dissect off the conjunctiva to reach up to the tenon's uh, layer after that we take the 15 number bart parker braid and try to dissect off until we reach at this stage where you can see very clearly here the pigmented area of the limbus which is about 1 mm beyond the vascularization into the cornea we try to dissect off this area by holding it carefully and dissecting off the pigmented limbus this is about 2 mm on to the cornea 2 mm of biopsy is taken and dissected off this biopsy is kept in a palin salt solution very carefully this is still not allowed to touch that and now we are going on to the affected eye so this is the disease eye in which a uh, in which a 360 degree periotomy will be done i'm sorry for the replay so this is where a 360 degree periotomy will be done uh, in this technique to decrease the uh, uh, to decrease the, the bleeding you can give brimodine uh, drops beforehand to the patient carefully dissect off the panis the whole of the uh, fibrous tissue is dissected off and now we are going on to dissect on the panis onto the cornea careful dissection is done and a plane is defined and you may or may not see a clear cornea below the criteria is not to see a clear cornea below but to see to remove the panis from the surface this patient has a very scarred cornea below so you can do a pre op asocity also to know how much depth you are reaching how much cornea below is thinned out how much of the how the scarring is present to help you during the surgery now a full amniotic membrane is laid on with the help of the fibrin glue on to the surface it is completely like a curtain falls on to the surface it is stuck in the periphery 360 degree uh, below the dissected conjunctiva and you wait for for 2 minutes period for it to stuck on to the surface and then you go back to your biopsy pieces and from the 2 mm biopsy that you can write you can cut it with the help of either a scissor or with a blade to 6 to 10 pieces and spread it on to the cornea in the mid periphery like in a circular form and with some distance in between leaving the visual axis clear and the next day that you see the patient this is how the patient looks on day 1 you can see these biopsies on the surface the visual axis has been spared and the amniotic membrane in the periphery the b cell is kept the patient is put on prednisolone and an anti antibiotic drops for about 4 to 6 times for about 2 weeks and a lubricating drops as you would see the screen here is the patient where on the day 1 you see has got portal flossing saying the total defect on the surface and this is how the transplant looks out on the first day slowly if you see the patient follow up on the day 5 you can see slowly this areas are clearing up from where the cells are growing from the biopsies the transplant you can see the epithelial cells are growing and slowly as you see on day 8 the epithelium has started to appear in fact the two splants the epithelium between the two splant transplants have started to coalesce and slowly the surface has started to become epithelial this is the two year follow up where you see the cornea is getting clear and this is the almost with the hro city you can see a very clear cornea and these are the leftover limbal biopsy that you can see and there is no risk to the donor eye uh, by the technique uh, which has been proven to be safe absolutely for the patient so i'll be sharing some of the cases uh, with variable uh, present from which have been treated with simple limb epithelial transplantation so this is a 8 year old child with a two weeks history of tumor injury 
and a four to five grade of chemical burn in the acute stage. About uh, six months presentation, you can see almost a total simple stem cell deficiency with a grade three simpliferon. Patient after slit and a three years follow up has gained a vision about six nine with a steel contact lens. This was a child. Uh, this is another patient which had a uh, previous two um, uh, ex vivo stem cell transplantations done elsewhere, the CLET procedures done elsewhere, and after 10 years of the failure, had come to us for our uh, stem cell transplantation. And this is the patient's eye affected eye, which you can see a mild haze is present, probably uh, because there were two attempts which were done, or probably because of the primary pathology. But the patient was amblyopic, did not gain much vision, but was very happy with the. Uh, outcome of the uh, the appearance of the eye. This was a patient which was 21 year old male patient with a one year history of firecracker injury. This is almost like a uh, ankylobrephron which is present. Only a PL positive uh, vision was there in the eye. The first attempt was of ocular surface reconstruction done where the simplifrons were released and uh, with, with the second set where uh, again it was combined with a slit. And a PK later, we got about, after one year follow-up, a best corrected vision of about 624 in this patient. So, uh, with these uh, initial outcomes, we had compared our results with the LV Prasad, which had in 2015 published the results uh, of their about 125 eyes in which they had published their set results. So, we found that uh, this technique was absolutely uh, reproducible and comparable. Yes. Uh, and we published our result in 2017 in IGO uh, in about 30 of the eyes and we found almost similar outcomes and about uh, 70 to 80 percent of success rate in our patients. Now I'll be sharing a patient where about uh, in which grade 5 burn because of a aluminium fall had happened and we later on combined the patient's sled with a, uh, with a PK and about 2.5 years of follow-up the patient's is maintaining at 612 uh, vision. Uh, we published our results of penetrating keratoplasty in these patients in which SLED was done previously and even PK results were very encouraging. In about seven eyes that we had done, the patients uh, maintained a very clear graph in six eyes and with a follow-up about one and a half to two years with a very good visual outcome in these patients. So it was very encouraging to combine this even with PK later on. So, this were majorly the results in patients where unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency was present, where the source of the donor for the limbal biopsy was the other eye. However, if you have a patient where the, both the eyes are affected, you would have to see if the donor could be a relative or you would have to take a cadaveric uh, limbal biopsy. So, I'm sharing a patient where an allograft, uh, allo stem cell transplantation through slit was done. This is the affected eye from, these are the two eyes of the patient, the right eye and the left eye. The right eye is where, the, where we saw some vision potential and the other eye was a very bad damaged eye. Uh, this was the eye for which the transplantation was done and the outcome of the patient was very good. We could release the simbiferon and here is where a recurrent simbifron came. However, the visual outcome was maintained very well. Later on, I went to simbifron this year. And the visual vision of the patient was maintained from a threatening simbifron, which you could see in the earlier. So if you look at the results from the uh, SLEP uh, uh, published literature, it shows that uh, the outcome in these patients on long term shows a very good improvement in the corneal clarity. So when we say we need to combine the PK in these patients later stage should be thought over very, very wisely. And only those patients which on an ASOST you see a very, very dense stromal obesity, only those patients require a dark or a PK. Most of these patients would clear on on a long term with only a simple limbal epithelial transplantation. So if you see at the prognostic indicators, you want to choose your patient, namely the grade of the simbifron you should think about, a severe simbifron would give you a poor outcome. If you need a PK or a LK at the same sitting, the outcome would be bad. If you have a good limbal biopsy, the outcome would be good. If previous surgical interventions have been done, then probably the results would be a little uh, bad for these patients. And if you have a good follow-up, the outcomes would be good. If we compare the results of SLED, CLET, and CLAW, we can see 
uh, we can compare that the outcomes are quite comparable at two to three years of follow-up with CLET and CLAW, which were the previous techniques. So to come to to come out to this slide, almost like summarizing my presentation. So if you see SLED, it's, it's a technique uh, in which the patient comes at a single time to your OR and you operate it at two times compared to CLET, where the patient has to come about two to three visits depending upon your lab growth. You do not require a lab in a SLED as compared to CLET. Uh, your epithelization time in a SLED is about two weeks and it's a repeatable procedure. It is absolutely affordable for the patient and the results, as you can see, are very good. And what I would like to highlight, the results in children are absolutely very, very encouraging as compared to other, other, other techniques. To conclude, uh, to manage a patient through an LSCT, you have to be absolutely wise in your approach. You have to tailor make your approach to the patient, treat the adnexia first. And uh, at present, I think simple limbal epithelial transplant uh, gives very encouraging results. It is affordable, reachable, and simple and probably common surgeons uh, should look out for this technique and learn it. Very, very easy technique to go ahead with. So thank you for your time, viewers, and thank you, Dr. Mehdi, for your patient hearing and for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta, for your kind and uh, informative presentation. It's extremely nice. Uh, now we are going to give the uh, talk to Professor Dr. Mahmoud Smail. He's going to talk about Reticular membrane and the keratoprocessor. Dr. Mahmoud, you could start now. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, let me first uh, thank uh, the, our guest speakers for their excellent presentation, especially the last presentation of Dr. Gupta. We, we really admire your work, Dr. Gupta, and thank you for your uh, illustrations. And I will speak about the keratoprocessor, and it's uh, an old archive dream, we have always dreamed to have an artificial cornea in our uh, hands. And since Von Hippel decided to publish the first keratoplasty, he had the idea of putting eye glass, uh, glasses in the, um, artificial glass in the, instead of the cornea, but of course this was long time ago. My history with uh, keratoprothesis started with dolman type 1, which is a very sophisticated kind of, uh, of keratoprothesis. It's two parts. You ensemble them inside the cornea, uh, and I will, uh, I will show you how to be uh, in, the, in the video now, how we use it. It says two-step uh, surgery. You depend that you have a screw and a nut. First, you do a pocket inside the eye in the, in, the, in the cornea. In a case like this, of course, this is highly vascularized cornea. And then you go forward uh, and uh, implant the first part of the prothesis, which is a kind of wrench, like uh, uh, with a fenestrated uh, periphery in the skirt. And this is uh, how it looks in the slit lamp in the early post-operative. As you can see, you see the wrench inside. This is uh, quite uh, engulfed inside the cornea. And this is the fenestrations in, uh, that encourages the vascularization to be sandwiched, the processes to be sandwiched. And then you take the patient once again to the, the operating theater and they remove the central part of the cornea corresponding to the empty part of the nut. And here you go for a cleaning at the edges and try not to, to make a lot of cautery uh, because you don't want to have necrosis. And then comes the crucial part when you start screwing in the uh, optical part, which is the nail part. And you start screwing and this is very crucial. And I'd like to, like to admit that in one case I couldn't screw it and I have to uh, uh, cancel the patient and then repeat suturing. And this is how it looks in the post-operative. Very crystal and clear, of course, the center part and eye is quiet and even you can see the details of the iris inside uh, the cornea, from uh, in the, inside the anterior chamber. But actually it doesn't work like this every time and unfortunately we had to, to switch to another technique which is the biointegrable keratoprothesis. The biointegrable keratoprothesis is a um, uh, it, it's a soft tissue keratoprothesis. It's not hard, it's very soft collagen, and it's a biointegrable. You start, uh, the, you start the surgery by making 
uh, marking and demarcation of the central cornea. You can use a calibrated diamond knife in order not to open the anterior chamber, just make a lamellar the, the section inside in, in the central cornea. Through what you will be making a, a pocket in the periphery. You still you don't open the anterior chamber yet, you're just making the pocket. And you have to have a very good uh, assistant that because a lot of bleeding will happen. Once you achieve that you have uh, uh, made a very long and deep uh, pocket, you then you proceed to open the anterior chamber and the clean the media. You clean the media from any membranes, any leftover of the cataract surgery, anything. If you have, if it's a patient, it's a phacic patient, you have to do anterior vitrectomy and leave the patient a phacic with vitromized, uh, anterior vitromized eye. Then you make some snips, a releasing incision in order to help the skirt of the biointegrable uh, prosthesis to fit inside the pocket. And then you suture the uh, releasing incision to tighten the, uh, the processes in its place. You have to make four uh, releasing incision and you have to suture them all. Uh, this is a short video, but as you can see, it will take at least two hours uh, surgery. And then the patient, uh, uh, and it's, uh, that's how it looks in the post-operative. It looks perfect, very quiet eye, and very nice, and very well-centered, and very, uh, the patient actually is um, hilarious after the surgery. Unfortunately, not all of the patient looks like this. This is the, the good eye, but then comes the melting, sudden melting, we don't know why. And then there is a cases of severe infection that happens any time. And this is the, the, the monster. The monster is the retroprothetic membrane, retrocorneal or retroprothetic membrane. It's a very thick membrane that happens uh, uh, after sometimes. We don't know when and we don't know how to treat them. Uh, it's very thick, vascularized. If you try to tackle them, it bleeds and it reforms again. And uh, I have tried several things first uh, by early postoperative to do YAG laser with them, but it, no sense. I tried to operate them and it comes back as if nothing had happened. You see the patient as if it's the same after pre and post of uh, uh, surgery for tackling the retrocorneal membrane. As you can see, it's very heavily uh, vascularized membrane and it is very thick and very uh, tough. Uh, when all of these disappointments happened to me and started to think about the old maestro, Prof. Dr. Muhammad Anwar, who taught us how to do deep lamellar cataplasty. Lamellar surgery, that was the thing. He injected air inside the, the cornea, uh, by which he separated lamellae of the cornea and he proceeded to make the talc and did make a big difference for us. So, with any kind of cornea, you get this perfect uh, result. Why don't we think lamellar in doing keratoprothesis? And how to do uh, lamellar keratoprothesis? You make a pocket, a hole inside in the pocket, and then you wait for, uh, and you implant the prosthesis with a protrusion, protrusion inside the anterior chamber to prevent the retroprothetic membrane. And then, after six weeks, you proceed to make a central perforation and optical perforation to be coinciding with the uh, prosthesis that you have embedded inside the lamellae of the cornea six weeks before. Let's go to uh, surgery, and I do have the patent of this prosthesis by my name, and I will show you a case which have undergone every kind of surgery in ophthalmology. And uh, starting from retinal attachment to, uh, to cataract surgery, to silicon oil removal, to uh, keratoplasty, to trabeculectomy, everything he has passed by any, every kind of procedure you have imagined. And this is the end, vascularized cornea, heavily vascularized cornea. 
and uh, of course there is no room here for another keratoplast. You proceed, as I said in the graph before, you proceed for lamellar pocket inside, to produce a lamellar pocket inside the cornea. This pocket, you have to do it tediously and slowly in order not to perforate either up in the lamellary or inside the uh, anterior chamber. You need a pocket first, very well done pocket. As you can see, the cornea is up to here. This is the, the limbus is here. And you proceed slowly, slowly by, by a crescent knife. I prefer the one from uh, Goida, it's very uh, friendly using. And this is the procedure, uh, pr uh, prosthesis, I'm sorry, and this is how the protruding part that fits inside the anterior chamber. And it's, as you can see, it's fenestrated all around to, inc to encourage to be engulfed. Then we produce the hole inside the posterior lamella, where the protruded part, where the protruded part of the prosthesis fits inside to prevent the future retroprosthetic membrane to happen. If you have a protruded part inside the anterior chamber, the retroprosthetic membrane does not happen. And this is how it looks. Then you in, uh, in, uh, embed it inside. And try not to suture uh, tight sutures because if you tighten the sutures, the, the prosthesis should be very uh, welcomed by the, 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 the cornea, not tightened, not under tension. The sutures not, should not be under tension. And you make uh, several suture, interrupted sutures, and by this finishes the first part of the surgery. As you can see, it is not, it's not difficult. And you just wash any remnants of uh, viscoelastic inside the pocket, the corneal pocket that you have uh, you have created and implanted inside the, 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 the process. Then you go and penetrate in the center and then you have an optical part that can the patient uh, see. The survival rate is more than five years until now. And um, if you ask me about the results I humbly uh, answer to you the question by saying something uh, uh, really uh, practical. 20 years ago, I used to do 20, 24 eyes of keratoprothesis by every year, but in the last year, I just did two cases only. And uh, that means that the results are not very encouraging. The patients can lose the prosthesis and uh, something that can happen uh, which is called extrusion. I leave you with this funny video of uh, Sheikh uh, Hosni that we all know. And this is one of uh, how the patients can see after the keratoprothesis actually. Thank yeah, you very that, much. That um, <laughs> Shukran, Dr. Mahmoud, for the nice presentation. Dr. Hosni, that's something that's a good Sheikh Hosni, yeah. Sheikh Hosni, yeah. Uh, now I'm inviting the uh, Dr. Omang and uh, Dr. Gopta to join us for discussion. Yes, I'm here, Dr. Mehdi. Yeah, and Dr. Omang as well. Yes, Dr. Omang? Yeah, I'm there. You are there. Okay. Uh, so, nice presentation. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for being with us and tolerated that much for this, uh, what happened in the uh, technical faults yeah, and I thank the audience as well waiting for us
for Dr. Uh, uh, Gupta. Yes. For the, uh, the limb transplant that you are doing, uh, uh, what is the exact area that you are getting from the limbus from the other eye? And how did you divide it? Uh, for the sled procedure, and usually even for the cleft, the superior and the inferior limbus is preferred. Primarily because it is documented through the histopathological as well as through the ASOST studies that the limbal stem cells are at high density in the superior and the inferior cloacas. Uh, you can take about two, depending upon the area which you have to cover, if it's a total limbal stem cell deficiency, you would require about 2 mm of your graft. If you are dealing with a partial limbal stem cell deficiency, you can take about one mm size of the limbus, about one clock hour. You get one clock, one clock hour up and one clock hour da down? No, you can take it from superior limbus itself. You can yes. reserve the inferior limbus for any repeat procedure that you require. At a time, you should only be touching probably one limbus zone. Then you divide it into five, six different parts and you stick it to the uh, amniotic membrane using the fibrin glue, right? Yes, yes. Yes, uh, rightly said, yeah. Don't you, is this not a, a scarcity and small amount of limbal stem cells? Would it, this small amount would stand to spread over the whole area? No, if you actually take a 2 mm biopsy, you would be able to dissect it uh, into 8 to 10 pieces and that is enough for a total limbal stem cell deficiency. It grows within two weeks, you will see if your procedure is getting successful, that the surface is getting epithelized. You are, you are not going to process it yourself to divide it? No, we do it on the table. You do? Table. Sure. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So you yes. divide into different cuts, then you stick it to the surface. Amniotic membrane. Yes, you can put it on the amniotic membrane uh, and put the fibrin glue uh, yeah. after spreading it and put a bandage contact lens over the surface. Is it possible to repeat it uh, several times later on? Yes, uh, we have done about, repeated about three times in a patient uh, where the donor eye remained the same eye of the patient. About two to three times you can repeat this procedure. The only, the only point is that you should be expecting a vision potential in the patient. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I would like to ask Dr. Gupta something. Did you try to put the stem cells uh, you have the, under the amniotic membrane or you prefer to put it on the top of the amniotic membrane by the glue? So we are following the technique which has been described by Dr. Sangha Nital uh, by the LV Prasad group and we are putting on the amniotic membrane. However, okay. there is a group uh, which has also uh, published uh, uh, putting the grafts between two amniotic membranes also. Yes. Uh, yes. But, uh, but, but the only thing I would be, uh, would be worried about by putting it below the amniotic membrane would be that probably the basement membrane of the amniotic membrane uh, that you are using should be the membrane on which the cells should be growing. If you put it below the amniotic membrane, I'm not sure how the cells would uh, use it as a petri dish. Would actually the cells use it and would you be losing those cells? You You're know? afraid to lose the cells when it's under the amniotic membrane, not amniotic on membrane. top. Amniotic membrane, yes, yes. And secondly, that we are not sure if the cells would grow below the amniotic membrane because it acts like a petri dish for the amniotic membrane cells to grow. For the still no, it's not confirmed yet. No. Yes, it's not confirmed yet. However, there is a group, as I described, uh, uh, they are using amniotic membrane above and below the biopsies. Yeah. They have published good results through it. But if you didn't use an amniotic membrane above, are you going to put a contact lens over the uh, implanted cells? Yes, that is very important primarily because you do not want the lid to be brushing ac across your, uh, your surface and you're losing the biopsies. Yeah. Or creating a defect postoperatively. So bandage contact lens really calls, becomes a barrier between the lid and the newly implanted limbal biopsies. For how long you, you would leave it uh, in place? Uh, for, about a, for about a week, but until you have an epithelized surface, you should be leaving the BCL on the surface. So you can take it off after one week and look for the epithelization. If you have achieved a good epithelization, you can even remove the BCL. If you haven't uh, uh, achieved epithelial surface, you can keep it about two to three weeks also. 
Thank okay. you very much. Let me ask Dr. Omang uh, about uh, something, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, beautiful presentation. Actually, the endotheliitis is a very important and crucial entity of herpetic uh, uh, viral infection, and it's really under-evaluated. I had a case a few weeks ago, of two, three months ago, the patient was uh, prepared for DMEX surgery. And I, I didn't, I was not convinced that this is Fuchs because it was, didn't like Fuchs and I refused the surgery for him. And now he is completely clear with just medical, um, medical treatment, Dr. Roman. Yeah. Yeah, so sometimes uh... We mistake fuchs and also pseudophagic corneal edema uh, from uh, endothelitis. So I think before, whenever in doubt, give a trial of steroids for a few weeks. That's it. That's you it. May have the eye clearing. Fuchs should be bilateral, so you should have the clue in the fellow eye. It is not very common to have bilateral herpetic disease. And especially, even if it is, it's less than 70% bilateral. And even if it is bilateral, it would be very rare that both the eyes are getting acute at the same time. Very, so, uh, very rare. Yeah. The clue should be in the fellow eye uh, about Fuchs. And that's what that's made me suspicious, and I refused the surgery and declined the patient for surgery, and I gave him medical treatment. Right. Actually, I do, I do a simple trick by injecting peribulbar uh, long-acting steroids. And actually, it gives a very, uh, uh, very good push to the endothelium in the first week until the topical uh, treatment uh, starts. Okay. Uh, the, the last patient was bilateral, and that was def that's why it was deceiving for the for the, the referral doctor who sent it to me. But it's a very I'm I'm really uh, I'm really grateful that you have um, uh, described it very uh, in your in, intensively in your uh, presentation. It's very important to uh, to think yeah. about it as I intend. No, in fact, we see after dendritic keratitis, I think the next most common presentation of herpes would be endothelitis. Yes, it's fairly common. They're very common, and I, we have yeah. to think about Dr. Menheim, go ahead. Would it be effective if you use the hydrocortisone for these cases? Topical hydrocortisone, I mean... Yes, you, you could use prednisolone, acetate, or any of the steroids. In fact, sometimes even a low-dose steroid works. And the important thing with the endothelitis is that taper your steroids very, very slowly. These eyes get dependent on steroids, so you have to go down to alternate day for several weeks. So if you start with four times a day or six times a day every week, you taper it off and then you need to be on alternate day, say, for a month and sometimes twice a week for a, another month. And I have a couple of patients who are on just once a week uh, diluted steroids and the moment you take them off that, they come back with a recurrence. So, Sometimes you have to leave them on a very low dose maintenance therapy and you would think what is once a week going to do but somehow uh, these eyes sometimes require that. So the tapering of steroids has to be very very slow in risky form. You, you always combine it with the antivirals or separately? Not necessarily. Uh, there is some people would say that you match a steroid to a dose of steroid and topical acyclovir. Uh, you don't need it for the treatment of endothelitis. It's an immune disease. But if you yes. have a patient who is uh, has a high risk of recurrence, for prophylaxis, you could give oral acyclovir. Oral, yes. 100 milligrams oral. Two a day. So the, the, I think there was a question, what's the prophylactic dose? So yeah, I, I see that. I was about to ask you. It is 400 milligrams two times a day. The treatment dose is 400 milligrams five times a day. So if you want to treat an acute infection, say stromal necrotizing keratitis, you would give a tablet acyclovir 400 milligrams five times a day for say about two weeks. 
the maintenance dose is 400 milligrams BD. That is the maintenance dose. For herpes zoster, the treatment dose is for 800 milligrams five times a day. For herpes simplex, it's 400 milligrams five times a day. And prophylaxis is 400 milligrams twice a day. Uh, you have any question, Dr. Mahmoud? No, we would like to thank them again. And uh, but I have something else for Dr. Dr. Nietzsche Omar. said yes. Uh, yeah. For about the work up for diagnosing infective keratitis, the way I presented is the way that I was always using it while I was working approved, while I was completely in charge about the patient and all my colleagues' patient as well. I mean that for infective keratitis, it should be organized to in order to reach a, a proper diagnosis. But in Egypt, these cases is being messed up because a lot of doctors interfering in the treatment at different stages. What, what is the work at you, uh, are you doing in your place? So any ulcer which is more than say two millimeter, uh, we do scrape every ulcer. Yeah. Uh, the scraping would entail gram stain and KOH as a minimum. And K I would say, so we have a proper microbiology lab. So it's for us, uh, we do grams and KOH and as well as we plate uh, on blood agar, chocolate agar, thioglycolate broth, sabroth, dextrose agar and brain heart infusion. And if we suspect acanthamoeba, then non-nutrient agar with E. coli overlay. So that is the whole spectrum. But if you were a comprehensive ophthalmologist without the whole microbiology setup, as a minimum, I would say all you need to get is a simple microscope, the one that you used in your labs when you were in school. You need to get a simple microscope. You need to get slides, cover slip, and 10% KOH. If you were to do just one test, most of the times you want to differentiate between is it fungus or is it bacteria very important and fungal for anybody you don't need to be a microbiologist koh mount is an easy step uh, every ophthalmologist should know how to look into uh, look for hyphae it takes maybe one hours of uh, training uh, that if and most of the times, if you can tell whether this is bacteria or fungus, you you eighty percent of the times you'll be fine just knowing that much. If fungus is positive, then you know you what treatment you need to give. Yeah. So one test, if anybody wants to really treat on your lulz, I would say just one test that you need to do, and that's KOH. Gram staining, if you can, is good. But gram staining, one requires a little technique and also the interpretation requires a little bit of experience. But KOH is very, very simple. All you have to do is scrape, put it on the slide, put a drop of KOH, put a cover slip and see under the microscope. That's all you have to do. Yeah, uh, somebody is raising his hand now. I will open the mic for him to ask by himself. Uh, Mohammed Murad, Dr. Mohammed, uh, you could uh, start your question. For whom you are. Hamad. Sir Mohammed. Yes, hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes. I am Hamad. Yes. Yes. Uh, as I heard from uh, uh, that, uh, we uh, we can use prophylactic acyclovir after post herpetic keratoplasty, long life. Is that right or not? Yes. Uh, so. Unfortunately, the prophylaxis effect is only for the time that you take it. It doesn't give you long-lasting immunity. Now, in the first place, you would need to do, uh, uh, you shouldn't be doing a keratoplasty on herpes because the results are generally very poor. So if you've done a keratoplasty on a herpetic patient, probably it's a one-eyed patient or a very precious eye. And to preserve that eye, you may need to give 400 milligram BD almost lifelong. Uh, number two, the prophylaxis dosage actually has come from skin dermatology. Uh, 
nobody has really done a very good study whether 400 BD is a good dose for ocular prophylaxis. So once in a while, you'll have a patient where who keeps getting recurrences even on 400 BD. So probably there will be some patients who require a higher dose for prophylaxis. But this has not been studied very well. Yes. So what about the side effects? The side what about, for example, the effect on kidney? The side acyclovir is generally very, very safe and tolerated quite well, except that you need to do kidney function tests regularly. So if your yeah. kidneys are de deranged, you shouldn't be giving acyclovir. But other antivirals are extremely dangerous for the kidney, especially yeah. in the age. Yeah. So that's the main uh, side effect. Otherwise, it doesn't really cause uh, gastritis much and the patients tolerate it quite well. Uh, yeah. Of course, sometimes expense becomes a problem uh, because it has to be taken regularly. In the older days, we used to give uh, prophylaxis with topical acyclovir, once a day kind of thing. Uh, one acyclovir can cause a little epithelial toxicity, so it can cause problems in healing in some of the neurotrophic and those kind of patients. And also the effectivity is not that good. So if somebody can tolerate oral medication, then it's better to give oral acyclovir prophylaxis. But if you're very desperate to give and you can't give oral acyclovir, you could try with just giving topical acyclovir a couple of times a day, long term. So to take 200, uh, 100 milligram twice daily as a prophylaxis? After 400, the... 400 milligrams twice a day. 400. 400. 400. 400. 400. 400. Two, tab two, ta two tablets for... Uh, two, two tablets. Yeah. A day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Magdi Mustafa is asking the same question that we have asked to Dr. Uh, Gupta that uh, the limbal cell transplant, is it above the amniotic membrane? Yes. Dr. Gupta insisted uh, that it should be on the above the amniotic membrane and not on the cornea. Yeah, it needs a substrate, you know. Yeah. But, but she do it like a sandwich. She stick first exactly. the amniotic membrane, then she stick the limbal graft to the amniotic membrane with the fibrin glue. So and then contact lens. It is a double. Then she put a lens to protect the transplant. Okay. Men, uh, I'm Nestakfi. Uh, 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 now you could conclude if you want. I, I would like yes. to thank Dr. Omang. Thank, thank you, you Omang. And thank you, Dr. Gopta. And uh, once, you, once this look uh, down is over, we would like to have you here back in Egypt. Sure, Please. we will. Well, thank should, you for I that. I would love to come and visit Egypt. Yeah, yeah you should come <laughs> for here. You, I have the pleasure that I enjoyed being with you at Chirov's Hospital, well, and thank you for the hospitality, both in the hospital and at home as well. Thank I you. would surely love to visit Egypt and see your beautiful country. We will arrange for this, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Umang and Dr. Gupta. Dr. Uh, Mahdi will, uh, will, will arrange this for us in sure. the next uh, <laughs> annual you. meeting. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.